This week on The Bioneers. We know the animals are viewing their world through clicks. We believe that we can capture these and send a picture of our world to their world and back and forth. We journey into the deep to explore the mystery of marine mammal consciousness with adventurer, author, and citizen scientist James Nestor. This week on Bioneers Radio. Support for the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature is provided in part by Organic Valley Family of Farms and by the generous support of listeners like you. Among indigenous peoples of the Pacific Islands, the whale is revered as the great living library of knowledge. Whale swims the oceans, remembering and feeling the memories of all living things, waiting for a time when humans can remember to talk to them and learn the wisdom we need to know to survive and live in harmony with Mother Earth. That time may have arrived. In the late 20th century, a handful of scientists proved that aquatic mammals have advanced communication capabilities and a consciousness strikingly similar to humans. Studies now reveal that, like humans, whales and dolphins possess a neocortex in their brains, which is associated with conscious thought, future planning and language, as well as spindle neurons likely involved in processing emotions. That could explain why they have complex social and family structures similar to ours. In 2012, Stephen Hawking led an international group of fellow scientists in signing the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, a paradigm-shifting statement that humans are not unique in possessing conscious awareness. In this half hour, we take a truly deep dive into the mystery of marine mammal consciousness with author and adventurer James Nestor. It's the astonishing tale of how a small band of free divers pushing the limits of human endurance is finding that saving the whales may become the story of the whales saving us. This is Whale Whisperers, making deep contact. My name is Neil Harvey. I'll be your host. Welcome to the Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. What is it like to do field research with the largest predators on the planet? The clicking you hear is not coming from a boat. It's not coming from a camera. That's what it sounds like to be in the water with sperm whales. It's so loud, your body vibrates and starts heating up after about 30 seconds. This is a calf. This is what it sounds like to be clicked by a sperm whale calf. James Nestor is a journalist and author of the book Deep, free diving, renegade science, and what the ocean tells us about ourselves. He's also an active member of the Dare Wind Project, a bold research technology organization dedicated to understanding cetacean click communication. It appears that these animals are communicating with clicks, and we're just starting to understand what those may be. And the key to understanding the click communication between these animals is to first understand their echolocation. Now, dolphins and whales view the world through clicks, through a form of sonar. What they do is they send out a very loud signal, and they wait for the echo of that signal to come back. And they collect all of that beneath their jaws, and they process that to uh, see with sound better than you and I can see with our eyes. A dolphin can tell the difference between a ping pong ball and a golf ball from 300 feet away by clicking with sounds. And a sperm whale can see a human from a mile away. These are the loudest animal sounds on the planet, sperm whale clicks are. And they can actually penetrate through flesh so they can get a 3D view of what you look like. They use these clicks in social behavior, and these clicks are extremely detailed. A sperm whale can repeat the same click over and over again down to the millisecond, and then can move around discrete frequencies within that millisecond long click, move them around and reorganize them and repeat those over and over again. 
the clicks aren't associated with, with words and paragraphs and sentences and phonemes, that's how human language works, but it's probably a digital form of communication, almost like a fax transmission or a modem. This is more precise than anything humans can make, okay? It's not a dog barking. This is obviously some form of communication. And uh, we're just sort of getting a view into what that might be. Although scientists were exploring cetacean echolocation by the 1950s, getting up close and personal with these massive animals has always been a challenge, particularly sperm whales. Even scuba diving equipment causes too much disturbance to observe and record their social behavior. What to do? Then synchronicity struck. Outside Magazine sent reporter James Nestor to cover the world championship of freediving. These extreme athletes could go deep and long underwater, very long, with no equipment but their bodies. I had never done any free diving, didn't know anyone who had, had never really heard of it. So I was pretty shocked when I went on out to Kalamata, Greece, and was sitting on the deck of a boat and watched this guy named William Trubridge take a single breath of air, upturn his body, and dive down into the water until he was completely gone. He stayed down there for four minutes. He swam 330 feet on a single breath of air, came up, exhaled, got out of the way for the next competitor. Uh, it completely blew my mind. So I did my research and found if there had been an air tank down there, and if these guys would have taken a hit off of that air tank, they would have died. Their lungs would have exploded as they came back up to the surface. Only the human body in its natural state can survive such a deep dive. It was miraculous to see these people making these deep dives, but it was completely horrifying to see the people who weren't making their dives. They would come up with blood on their face, they would come up passed out. One guy was technically dead for two minutes until he was resuscitated, and it looked completely insane to me that these people had honed their bodies to do something so incredible, and yet were just using it to dive up and down a rope to get a plastic medal, to get bragging rights with their friends, to get a few pictures on YouTube. Luckily, while I was out there, I was able to meet some more philosophical freedivers. And these people had absolutely no interest in competition. They didn't want to go through the face-off with death. They just wanted to explore their own bodies, these natural reflexes that we're all born with, and they wanted to explore the ocean in its most intimate way, and that is by freediving. And some of these people were also using freediving for scientific research. They were able to free dive very close to marine mammals. And I started hanging out with these guys. They seemed to be much more logical, philosophical, spiritually minded, and I identified with them a lot more. And what this group is doing right now, they're called Darwin Project, and just full disclosure, I've been working with them for a few years. This team is gonna try something pretty revolutionary. They're gonna try to capture in the full high fidelity, high definition, these clicks, and then shoot them back to the animals and begin a sort of visual conversation with them. We know the animals are viewing their world through clicks, through sonograms, also holograms. We believe that we can capture these and send them back. So it's not so much saying hello, it's sending a picture of our world to their world and back and forth. Sending pictures of worlds back between worlds from the Indian Ocean and Scandinavia to both Pacific coasts. That's part of what motivates these divers, who spend most of their year in rickety boats miles out to sea, waiting and waiting to make contact with sperm whales. Nestor did his best to remain an objective journalist and observe the divers from the deck of the boat. But the magic takes place underwater, and the team insisted that the journalist free dive with them. After all, they said, Jane Goodall didn't study primates from an airplane. It took him months and months of intensive training to be able to dive deep enough. I was apprehensive about it. I mean, a, a sperm whale is 60 feet long, 8 inch long teeth, largest predator in the world, hunts 50 foot long squid, not the sort of animal you should normally be hanging out with. So we went to uh, Sri Lanka. We got in the water and the boat took off. 
And we're just sitting there, and we heard some clicks, and we're like, okay, this is, this is good. And then the clicks get louder, you know, louder and more frequent and louder. And it's really hard to describe what this is like because uh, the lower frequencies are more powerful than the frequencies that you hear. So you're, you're feeling this in your body. And it was a mother and a calf that came up to us and were clicking us, got about six feet away from us. And uh, they knew exactly what they were doing. And what they were doing with those clicks is they were taking pictures of our bodies. And this isn't some theory, this is fact. So they can see that we have big brains, that we have lungs, that we are not something that's ordinarily out in the middle of the ocean that they would eat. That's what triggers them to want to hang out. And I believe that triggers them to want to communicate with us. There is an immediate sense of knowing when you get in the water with these animals that they are not there to hurt you. If they were there to hurt us, they would have done it years and years and years ago. They are extremely curious and extremely nimble not to even bounce into you. And we're about this big, one, one little move and, and you're gone. That was my first experience. It was pretty brief, but completely mind blowing. And then the next day it was just full on. We were having experiences all the time with males, with mothers, with pods. And we recorded something called a shotgun click. And this is the clicks that these animals use to stun giant squids from miles deep because that's how they hunt. So why don't they use those clicks with, with us? Why don't they stun us? Why do they come to us in peace after we've spent the last 200 years completely annihilating their populations? I mean, these are big questions. And I don't know why, but all my experiences with them since then have convinced me that this is an animal that has a great wealth of wisdom that knows exactly what it's doing. And I think that there's a reason that they keep coming up to us and sending us communications. The Darewin Project's divers interact with the animals respectfully, on their terms, in their element. The whales are choosing to come to them. Leading the Darewin Project is Fabrice Schnoller. Once again, synchronicity seemed to pluck an ally off the land into the deep. He was a construction contractor, engineer, very, very successful guy. He was on a boat off the coast of Mauritius saw some whales, got in the water, knew nothing about them. They surrounded him in a circle, tails down, heads up, and peppered his body for two and a half hours. He didn't know about echolocation. He didn't know about sperm whales. And he came out, quit his job, and this is all he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this, this is the guy leading this. And, and this was someone on a completely different path. But, you know, maybe they chose him. We were down in Los Angeles last year, and I've never seen a dolphin in L.A. in my whole life. So, and I grew up in, in Orange County. The first day he was out there, uh, he was surrounded by dolphins. The second day he was out there, he was surrounded by dolphins. The fifth day, I said, you're complete bullshit. I'm going to go out there. And the same thing happened. I think that they, they're able to echolocate so they can get a picture of what you look like, and they're likely able to send that picture around to other dolphins. So... I think he's world famous in the, in the <laughs> dolphin community. Since 2007, when Fabrice Schnuller began designing and building his own recording equipment, he and his team have collected the largest database of sperm whale behavior and vocalizations in existence. Schnuller learned that dolphins have first and last names, and they exchange them with one another. They also introduce themselves when they meet free divers. Aided by his custom recording equipment, Schnuller decided to try an experiment. Dolphin whistle, it's a sine wave, so it's a very smooth wave, and he corrupted it so it was very angular, very harsh signal. And when the dolphin gave him his name, his signature whistle, Fabrice played his name, this corrupted whistle, back to the dolphin, who was just sort of like freaking out. The dolphin understood it, took it around. Fabrice was in the water a month later, and all the dolphins came up to him and were repeating his name, that corrupted whistle. And that, that corrupted whistle is, is, has never been uh, recorded before. Like, there, no one has ever recorded a whistle anything close to that. That's what turned him on to dedicating his, his life to this stuff. Schnuller became fascinated by communications among sperm whales. When they talk amongst themselves, they have various dialects, depending on where they live in the ocean. They can communicate over hundreds, perhaps thousands of miles. 
Some researchers suspect that when sperm whales go very deep, where sound travels even further, they could be communicating with each other around the world. The question is, what are they saying? Thanks to the Darwin Project and a small group of other citizen scientists, we may yet know, if that is, we start really listening. More from James Nestor when we return. This is Whale Whisperers, Making Deep Contact. I'm Neil Harvey. You're listening to The Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. If you love Bioneers Radio, it's free and easy to support us. Just take a moment to post a review on our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you find our show online. You'll be helping other people find and enjoy these incredible thinkers and storytellers. And thank you for helping us out. In any functional and healthy relationship, one of the most important behaviors is to honor old agreements, agreements that have endured over time, like marriage vows or a national constitution. Our human relationship with nature has evolved over hundreds of thousands of years. It's only fairly recently that we started living on the earth like aliens. Like aliens, we've done all we can to separate ourselves from nature and try to override its laws and limits. The solutions we've come up with are solutions aliens would invent. Clearly, they're not working. What would a new science of nature look like if it involved a process of restoring relationships? What if we started by asking nature, Who are we? What did we used to do? What did you rely on us to do? And what if we asked other species and ecosystems and paid attention to the answers we received? James Nestor's mind-bending dive into cetacean communication is revealing some very old agreements. It's showing just how similar we are as mammals to our underwater counterparts. The human fetus develops in an amniotic fluid that is 99% similar to seawater. The blood coursing through your veins right now is 98% similar to seawater. We're missing a molecule of magnesium. Seawater is missing a molecule of iron. Beyond that, it is almost identical. So when we come out of the womb, we are born to dive. You place an infant in water, she will most likely reflexively duck her head below for about 45 seconds at a time, open her eyes, and start breaststroking. We only lose this ability once we learn how to walk. Uh, Ancient cultures knew all about free diving for tens of thousands of years. People were free diving for pearls, for sponges, and for food. This was a part of their culture. And there were reports in the 1600s and 1700s of some divers in Japan and in the Persian Gulf that were able to dive for 15 minutes at a time, Uh, which of course is impossible, right? Well, the current record breath hold right now is about 12 and a half minutes. So we're just almost have reached those impossible claims. We all have these abilities to dive very deep. They're called the mammalian dive reflexes, and we're born with them. They have just found a way to hone them very well. It also turns out that we not only have mammalian dive reflexes, but we have also other senses and reflexes we share with oceanic animals, such as magnetoreception, echolocation, and sophisticated forms of communication. And it makes sense, considering that we all came from the sea. The virtual technosphere that human beings have constructed allows us to communicate and exchange information worldwide at lightning speed. But it has also diminished our somatic awareness, as well as our use of our natural senses. When James Nestor explored the science of magnetoreception for his book Deep, he found that sharks have a natural GPS system that homes in on electromagnetic fields. How, then, do we restore our connection to the innate intelligence surrounding us and to the nature within us? Since few of us will ever free dive, paradoxically, the very technology that has separated us from nature may be one key to reconnecting us and inspiring us to honor old agreements. 
part of what the Darwin Project is doing is capturing these interactions in 360 video for virtual reality purposes because this can really take people into this world. It's not a recreation of nature. It's a reflection of the wonders in nature. To take people into the world they will literally never, ever see. And I think that that can be an important educational tool. What I'm hoping is that virtual reality will start taking over in aquariums and at water parks and at zoos to allow people to see these animals in their natural wild environment when they're healthy and happy as opposed to in a cage. VR is a great way to uh, you know, provoke empathy within people, to show them that sperm whales aren't out to kill people, to show them that, that dolphins need to be out in the wild and not in a pool or a tank, uh, I think is an important message. And that's why I'm very interested in virtual reality and working on a number of virtual reality films right now to take people into these places. Virtual reality provoking empathy for wild reality. Nestor is now working with the United Nations and a team of scientists and engineers to build a system of machines that can identify, capture, and send back click communication to sperm whales, hoping to spark a kind of sonographic exchange with the animals. Countries such as Norway and Japan routinely flout international commercial whaling bans. Oceans are increasingly busy places, and noise pollution from military sonar and other sources continue to injure and even kill the animals. Unintentional ship strikes are an ongoing threat to whales, particularly in coastal waters. Massive amounts of plastic pollution in the oceans pose another serious threat to whales, rupturing their stomachs and blocking their digestive systems, which causes them to starve. Some conservation efforts have successfully restored the numbers of humpback whales, leading to their removal from the endangered species list in 2016. And Nestor is collaborating with the United Nations' other organizations to end easily preventable death traps for whales such as shipping lanes and fishing nets. As we tap into communication with other species, perhaps they're telling us, for them, it's one minute to midnight. Perhaps they're asking us to remember what we've forgotten about honoring old agreements. To remember that in ancient Greece, dolphins were granted the same rights as citizens. A lot of people thought it was never going to happen. These guys uh, don't have any ability to do this. You know, it, it just seemed like a sort of new age dream. But what's happening now, and these guys are the only people who are, who are going to really... <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, you know, for those people who do criticize this kind of research, uh, because it is crazy, it may not work, but I really think it's important that someone tries to do this. The fact of the matter is we're totally running out of time for more genteel approaches here. In about 30 years, the entire ocean ecosystem is going to collapse. You ask any marine biologist, and they're going to tell you the same thing. And the first animals that are going to die off are going to be the largest, specifically dolphins and whales. So why not take a moonshot and go for it and try to make contact with these animals before they're all gone? And this could also be a way of help saving them. Uh, there's still three other countries that are still whaling. It's unbelievable, but true. And so this could be a way by making contact, even initial contact with them, to um, giving them the same rights as other animals and other humans have. So, so again, we know these animals are talking to each other. We just don't know what they're saying. In the next decade, just consider this, the U.S. is going to be spending $100 million looking for signs of non-human intelligent life in the universe but there is already non-human intelligent life in the universe. It's here on our planet. It's in our seas. <laughs> and I think it's time we start listening to it. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, you guys. Thank you. James Nestor, Whale Whisperers, Making Deep Contact.
You can see and hear more from James Nestor and explore more Bioneers radio programs, podcasts, and videos online at Bioneers.org. For information on attending the National Bioneers Conference and Bioneers events in your area, please visit Bioneers.org or call 1-877-BIONEER. The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature is a production of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute. Executive producer, Kenny Osabel. Written by Kenny Osabel. Senior producer and station relations, Stephanie Welch. Host and consulting producer, Neil Harvey. Program engineer, Emily Harris. Interview recording engineer, Emily Harris. Our theme music is co-written by the Baca Forest people of Cameroon and Baca Beyond from the album East to West. All royalties from Baca compositions and performances go to the Baca Forest people through the charity Global Music Exchange. Find out more at globalmusicexchange.org. Additional music was made available by Growing Bin Records at growingbinrecords.com. For more music information, please visit bioneers.org. The opinions expressed on the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute, the underwriters, or this radio station. My name is Neil Harvey. Thank you for listening. I invite you to join the Bioneers in inspiring a shift to live on Earth in ways that honor the web of life, each other, and future generations. This is program number 0217. This program was made possible in part by Organic Valley's pasture-raised organic dairy products, bringing the good from our family farmers to your table at organicvalley.coop and by the generous support of listeners like you.